welcome to the Plant-Based Telehealth um, live Q&A every second and fourth Thursday of the month. Um, sometimes we have special guests, sometimes it's just us hanging out together, sometimes we have our new doctors like, like Dr. Jeff Pierce, who's currently licensed in California and soon to be Texas. Um, but uh, that's where we're here. We're here to answer your questions. If you're on the Facebook page, great. Um, please share to anyone that you feel would be interested to any groups so we can increase um, who's watching this. That is, would be excellent. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Miller, Dr. Clapper. How are you guys today? Great, thank you. Great, great to be here. Excellent. So we did get a question regarding um, GERD. Um, let me pull it up actually. So she said, um, she goes, hello, my husband's been on a whole food plant-based diet without added salt, oil, or sugar for 10 years and was diagnosed with silent GERD via endoscopy four to six months ago. He coughs frequently and gastroenterologist did an endoscopy at the same time as his routine colonoscopy. We're searching for causes. He does not drink coffee and drinks one to two glasses of wine a week at most. Any thoughts or suggestions on causes and remedies? Maybe you guys have mm. to take that one. Well, uh, it's a significant issue. If, if he's coughing up, it just takes a couple of drops of stomach acid to uh, work its way up to the back of your throat and you inhale it into your lungs when you breathe. It usually happens while people are sleeping and you wake up with this wretched hacking cough and nobody can figure out the, uh, the cause of it after all the chest x-rays and antibiotics, the light suddenly goes on. Maybe this is uh, coming out from down below there and he's inhaled stomach acid. Um, so what to do? Uh, start with simple things. Uh, water does not run uphill, neither does stomach acid. So I would get a couple of blocks of uh, four inch blocks of wood, put them under the head legs of your bed and raise the head legs of the bed at least four inches up to six inches, but any more than six inches and husbands slide out the foot of the bed there. So <laughs> around, around you know, four inch elevation at least. <laughs> and, um, and you can do this with a couple of two by fours, but they have commercial blocks you can get off Amazon there, but raise your head of your bed. Uh, people say, well, I sleep on an extra pillow. Does not work. By three in the morning, everybody slithers down flat. You gotta physically raise the head of the bed up there. Um, don't eat a big meal, plant-based or not, before you go to bed. Uh, if you put a big food mass down there, it physically stretches open the stomach and makes that valve a little bit more incompetent, easier for acid to leak up. Um, do your, have your big meal either earlier in the day, like five in, in the evening, uh, or in the middle of the day while you're upright, and so the food can leave out through the pylorus at the bottom, not come up there, uh, uh, up into your esophagus. Um, the uh, other things to do is um, uh, some folks get relief with um, uh, uh, deglycerizinated licorice or slippery elm. Those can be very soothing for the gut wall there. And, um, uh, and, and again, uh, your light meals, since protein and, uh, and starches summon up the most acid, uh, in your, how about in the evening? Have a, have a salad, some soup, maybe a little fruit, and, and that's it. Make your, your evening meal kind of light. Don't lay down uh, with a big distended stomach full of acid. If you just do those things, uh, there's a good chance that this will, uh, will settle down. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, and then, of course, some other things outside of this particular case, pregnancy, being overweight, certain medications can cause it, like calcium channel blockers, um, things like mifedipine. Um, amlodipine, um, verapamil, I think some of those others, but the um, things to consider also is just as like he said, is just elevating the bed and then looking at those large meals, I think are serious culprits. Of course, caffeine, citrus foods, maybe tomato products, you want to be a little bit careful. I had one patient that carrots just, otherwise she was great, no other problems. <laughs> but um, Chris, any other suggestions? Yeah, I'm with both of you guys. So I, um, first of all, it's just, it's just a sign how we're all so different, right? Because you follow a whole food plant-based diet for 10 years and you're, you're still having um, signs of heartburn and GERD. But um, so I agree with the food sensitivity or um, 
keeping a food journal. And so looking at what you eat and when you get it, because there may be a weird trigger for you. So maybe citrus, maybe to make cooked tomatoes tend to be worse than um, raw tomatoes. Um, and sometimes we do find tease out unusual things or unusual spices. And when you're getting it, stress can absolutely play a role because it's originally called the stress ulcer, right? So um, stress, stressful thoughts will increase inflammatory changes in that area. And then also other causes. So some people just have a weak sphincter there and there's certain foods that could weaken it. So like eating chocolate might weaken it, peppermint might weaken that sphincter, and then you get more reflux. So again, looking at a food diary is helpful. Um, and then anything else going on with you, like sometimes if your if your digestion isn't moving through, which I imagine if you're plant-based, it probably is, but if it's backed up, sometimes that the gastrochoresis is called, it's not moving through can cause heartburn. Um, so that being said, if you can tease out a little bit what's going on, that's helpful. And then like Dr. Clapper said, just changing your diet around and changing the timing and, and head, help edit elevating the head of the bed. And I also use some of those demulcents. Um, so like he talked about slippery elm and DGL. Um, and I also use aloe is a good one that you can take a little bit before your meal or uh, marshmallow root tea. You can sip before a meal and it kind of helps coat the stomach lining. Um, and then you eat a smaller meal and maybe you'll get some relief. So just some random thoughts. It's, it's real, and it's really important for the uh, person who wrote in to check with the gastroenterologist to the scope and, and hear it from her or his own ears or own lips. Um, what, did you see any evidence of a hiatal hernia? Um, it, because if the veil uh, that's supposed to keep the stomach acid down in the stomach has slipped up into the chest, it becomes incompetent and you can take all the slippery elm you want, but sometimes that just has to be fixed. Nowadays, they can do these elegant procedures through a, through a scope, and they can staple it and, and uh, repair a hiatal hernia without, uh, there's, they have incisions with surgery law for it. But, uh, but find out, is there a hiatal hernia present? Here? So you've got, you've got to deal with that one way or the other. Excellent. And so with speaking of hiatal hernia, we did get a question on the Facebook page. Would you recommend surgery for a hiatal hernia for an 82-year-old? I think it would depend on the significance of the hiatal hernia, the symptoms, um, what exactly is going on, the health of an 82-year-old. Um, of course, avoidance of surgery, if at all possible, is something to consider. But some of these are really large. I've had a patient that actually took up like a third of their chest cavity, shortness of breath, a variety of other things going on. So, I mean, it really is interesting. You could have a small one, you could have a large one. It really just depends. But any thoughts on that for you guys? Oh, I absolutely agree. I'm, I'm a big fan, of, especially nowadays, since uh, uh, in the old days, in the 80s, I was doing anesthesia, that surgeon had to do these big incisions and this all uh, major overhaul of the plumbing there. Now they do these elegant procedures through the whole scope and through the endoscopes. Since it's so non-invasive and, and infective and effective, um, I'm a big fan of fixing these, even at 85. It's a daycare procedure nowadays. You, uh, you barely even need to be in the hospital, maybe overnight if you're 85, 82. Uh, but yes, uh, get this fixed. If, it's, if you've got a significant amount of your stomach up in the chest, nothing good comes from that, actually. Get, get that fixed. Any, Chris, any thoughts there? I uh... Yeah, no, I have nothing much more to add. Depending on the person and your overall and how bad it is and what your symptoms are and benefits versus risk, as always, so. Yes, a risk versus benefits, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, another question here is, what is your opinion on getting a colonoscopy versus flexible sigmoidoscopy versus simple stool test for women over age 50? Any of you like to speak to that? I have ideas, Krista. Uh, yeah, I can, sure, I can start talking with this. That's an interesting question and um, something we think about a lot. So as of right now, the data is still supporting a colonoscopy as a screening test, not a flex sit, I don't believe. So um, I'll, although it, this might be changing where maybe you can do a blood test and a flex um, flex sit and get get the same results. But um, for right now, if there was something a little bit higher up than just a sigmoidoscopy would see, um, colonoscopies can still pick that up. So, um, and it depends on the person's risk. So if you, I don't know what family history is or what your previous diet was, what you ate for all the years before you were plant-based, um, any other concurrent medical conditions, 
and your risk, your overall risk of the disease. For, um, for the majority of people, I'm still recommending at least a one-time colonoscopy. And then if they find no polyps and you're 100% on this great whole food plant-based diet, then we can talk about maybe just doing the um, stool samples in the future. Um, but I'm a little hesitant to recommend it, although I'm watching data. So maybe you guys know something different and I am definitely open to learning something new. I think they recommend if you're going to do the Flexig that you do it every five years, maybe the colonoscopy every 10, but they do, you know, if you're African-American or, or black, they do recommend starting at 50 or 45, excuse me. And then 50, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just turned 50. I've been on a plant-based diet going on nine years. I do plan on doing that um, at some point in the near future, just because I think it's warranted. Cause I, I spent 40 years not eating this way. So um, I certainly think it's something to consider looking at your family history. Um, again, like you said, you know, other illnesses, uh, but family history is a big one as well. Dr. K, any thoughts on that at all? Uh, no, I think you guys uh, summed it up pretty well. Um, one baseline colonoscopy is, you know, a reasonable thing to do. But after that, and, and as you said, uh, both of you mentioned family histories. Uh, you know, if your father, two uncles, and a brother all died of colon cancer at age 45, then, you, you know, you really need, you clearly have a propensity that you should uh, keep a close eye out on, and frequent endoscopies uh, are, are not inappropriate. If there's just no family history, you've been eating a plant-based diet, you know, since birth in the last 25 years, and you've had one negative colonoscopy, gee, I, I think it's reasonable to, uh, you know, to check your stool in the, once a year, once a year, once every other year with this with a Colagard test looking for cancer uh, genetics or, um, and certainly for cult blood in the stool. And uh, if those are consistently negative, again, a flexic uh, exam once every five years should be more than adequate. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, um, I'm not, not, once you uh, have a full colonoscopy, there's little to be gained from continuing to keep that. Yeah, there's a question, what's the difference between a colonoscopy and a flex uh, sigmoidoscopy? So basically, when you look at the flexible sigmoidoscopy, it can visualize the rectum, the sigmoid, and like the bottom part of the descending colon, whereas this, the full colonoscopy does the full colon. So you're like Chris said, you're only seeing part of um, the colon with the, the flex sig. So um, and then here's another question. It's supposed to be a little less invasive and a little less painful, but yeah. um, the truth is if it's a screening test, it can miss things. So I'm not entirely sure unless it's a follow-up. Yes, absolutely. Um, she says here, hello, I'm in the process of putting in a request for blood work. Is there anything that you'd recommend adding to this list? So this is what she's requesting. She's a 44 year old female who's been, is plant-based. I don't know for how long. She says lipids, omega-3 index, homocysteine, vitamin D, um, CBC, A1C, and ferritin. Um, that's her list. I would include B12 and methylonic acid is really helpful if you're looking to see um, those, the B12 levels important. Anything else that you guys would uh, recommend? Um, you don't have a CMP there. Sorry, Dr. Clover. Yeah. Um, so um, just a basic CMP to look at your liver, kidneys, electrolytes. The CMP is a comprehensive medical, metabolic profile. It's a blood chemistry, essentially. Uh, but also, you uh, one I was you want at least one marker for inflammation. You might, might want to try a C-reactive protein or a high sensitivity CRP, and if that's significantly elevated, you need to do a little looking after that. Uh, a, a low CRP below one is, is reassuring. Uh, probably not a lot of evil inflammation going on in your arteries and your tissues. Uh, but those are the other two that, that I would recommend adding. Perfect. Okay. Um, next question. Uh, Don says, I have an A1C of 6.1 on a plant-based diet, almost all foods, I'm sorry, plant-based diet, almost all whole foods, but with a fair amount of fat, 100 grams per day. An active lifestyle, thoughts about reducing the A1C, reduce your fat intake for sure. I don't know what you're consuming that would be 100 grams per day, but that's a significant amount. Um, any thoughts there for you guys? Yeah, yeah, I sure do. Yeah, Chris, you, you want to... <laughs> I agree. I, I don't have much to add except for what you already said. Be curious what you're eating. And, and um, we know that fat, when we reduce our fat, it lowers, it increases our insulin sensitivity. So I would work towards that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, this gets down to the basic misunderstanding that so many people have about diabetes. If the problem is sugar and, uh, and uh, we can't metabolize sugar. And yes, that's what you see when you look at it. But why is it? It's not from eating sugar. 
it's from eating too much fat. It's a disease of fat toxicity. The fat infiltrates into your liver cells, into your muscle cells, and keeps the insulin mechanism from working. So, so there's insulin in the blood, but uh, it doesn't uh, allow the sugar into the cell. Uh, and, uh, and I shudder, uh, these keto folks, oh, high fat, low carb, you're going to have low blood sugars if you just don't eat any carbs. Well, that's true. But meanwhile, we're carbohydrate burning organisms and, and ketosis is a state of acidosis. It's not a good state to stay in long term. Uh, uh, this man needs to cut back on his fats and increase the, the whole food carbohydrates. We're talking about whole, you know, green vegetables and whole grains and uh, um, low glycemic uh, foods that don't raise blood sugar up. Uh, and, and let your insulin receptors clear out uh, from all that fat, and you'll find that that hemoglobin A1C comes down. But a high fat diet is going to keep your insulin in, uh, insulin or keep your glucose uh, intolerant. Uh, absolutely. So, yeah. yeah he, he said lots of nuts, and absolutely, I have. I'd say 95% of my patients are diabetic and I've seen this so many times eating lots of nuts, avocados, things like that. They think a little bit of oil is okay. Uh -uh. You got to cut that stuff out. And when you do, you're going to see your A1C decline. I would also get a continuous glucose monitor if you don't already have one. These things are super helpful. So what happens is when you eat this high fat meal, like nut butters or nuts and some other things, you'll see that your blood sugar goes up and it stays up a little bit longer. But if you eat the same meal without the nuts, you're going to see this go up and it come down. Um, and it, it happens every single time. So definitely cut back on the nuts. That would be huge. And I'm not saying nuts are unhealthy, but in small quantities. So this is a reminder. When I was a kid, we'd get those little nuts, but they were in the shell. Like they, you get like the walnut, the pecan, and you'd spend mm -hmm. 30 minutes working on two nuts and you're like, I'm done. That's about how much you probably should be containing. So, you know, you got to work for your food <laughs> instead of just pulling it out of a bag already shelled. Just think about that. So like a handful a day would be fine. But other than that, you guys, you don't need lots and lots of nuts. Um, again, they're not evil, but it's just, just take us in context of what's going on. But all right. So next question. Um, here we go. Karen asks, I've been 100% plant-based, whole food, no oils or salt for 12 months because I was diagnosed with diabetes. I'm now fit and slim at 130 at five foot seven. Congratulations. Um, but I can't get my morning fasting glucose below 160. Let me reiterate, I don't eat fat. I use chronometer to monitor my intake. Now I'm back on metformin and want off. Okay, I have my thoughts, but Karen, I would say definitely come see us. We need to check a few things, <laughs> including the C peptides and antibody tests. Let's make sure there's not some autoimmune component to your diabetes, um, because if you're already at a pretty healthy weight and you're eating a whole food plant-based diet for 12 months, there's something else going on. But I'd really be curious to see, again, a continuous glucose monitor, see what you're doing overnight, um, and some other things, how late you're eating at night, a variety of things. But any other um, thoughts or suggestions there? And there's sometimes small tweaks as in changing your diet. So like we, I noticed when my patients are eating fruit at night, they're waking up with higher blood sugars or more carbohydrate rich at night, they're waking up with higher blood pressure or blood glucose. And so instead we're playing around with more vegetables and beans for dinner and the carbs earlier in the day. And so we just kind of, but if, again, I agree with Dr. Marvis, if your numbers are significant or consistently elevated like that, you may have some more going on and you need, need to do some blood work for that. Uh, yes, uh, what they're saying is that uh, there's a so-called type one and a half diabetes where uh, uh, the person's uh, pancreas is being slowly damaged by antibodies and their ability to produce their own insulin is going down. Uh, and if so, you look for the antibodies and you look for their actual insulin production. So that's what you mentioned measuring the C peptide for and that antibody panel. So find out if you're type one and a half and you can work with Dr. Marvis if that's the case. Uh, but uh, with that continuous glucose monitor as you mentioned uh, and, and, and Dr. Miller's uh, food diaries. And so keep track of what you ate and what your sugar was the next morning and eventually the patterns will start becoming clear there and that continuous monitor is just it's a really valuable tool there. So you got some great advice from my colleagues there. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, and I've had a few cases, um, I would say maybe five to 10, where we've actually seen people with low C peptide um, and they have all negative um, antibodies, all the five tests are negative. So there's also other concerns and considerations. Um, you know, there are, there is destruction of your 
beta cells, which produce insulin, which reside in your pancreas, um, just from having type two diabetes too. And that might be part of the issue. You just may have done some damage that you just can't produce enough insulin. So um, again, that would be where testing is. And we can look at you personally at plantbasedhealthhealth.com guys, check us out. You see Dr. Clapper, Dr. Miller, myself and Dr. Jeff Pierce. Um, we'd love to see you um, come see us in a, we get a real joy out of working with people just like you. So, all right, next question. I got some good questions here. Um, my husband has been whole food plant-based uh, for five years. His recent blood work showed elevated triglycerides over 200 and low HDL 30s. This is the first time his lipid profile has been so poor. He's been very stationary through the pandemic, working from home and not doing much movement. Any suggestions? Well, high triglycerides usually mean too much sugars. Uh, they're, they're the, in general, sugar in your diet, especially in its whole form, is in the form of whole vegetables, etc., will not turn into fat on your body, no matter how much broccoli you eat. It's not going to turn into fat. But the one fat that can, the one sugar that can turn into fat, are these simple sugars, fructose, uh, uh, dextrose. Uh, if you're eating, if you're drinking soft drinks, eating uh, vegan candy bars or whatever, just, just uh, and and fruit juices will do it. And, and some folks who just go on a very fruit heavy diet, um, their 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 liver will turn uh, some of that fructose into uh, triglycerides. So you might want to throttle back on the on the obvious sweet foods in your diet. Doesn't mean you can never have an apple. But, but for right now, to your next lipid panel, uh, cut and follow back on the on the sugars and the sweet foods that you're eating. Uh, and, um, and as people change their diets, um, uh, sometimes the liver will put out more cholesterol or, or less HDL. Uh, oh, she didn't mention her cholesterol level, though. Uh, she just her triglycerides and her HDL. That may not be bad at all. When, when total cholesterol goes down, HDL goes down for a good reason. You know, they say HDL is like the garbage trucks that take the, uh, the, uh, the cholesterol out of the plaques and brings it back to the liver. But if there's no garbage, you don't need a garbage truck. And as people's uh, uh, total cholesterol goes down, HDL often follows down. So it may be, not be a terrible thing. Uh, but finally, Again, uh, talk about the tyranny of the numbers. We give these numbers so much power. Uh, the issue is what's really going on in your artery walls? Are they inflamed? Are they, are they developing atherosclerotic plaque or not? Uh, there are some inflammatory markers you can get, high sensitivity CRP, uh, uh, oxidized LDL, uh, isoprostane, that can tell you if that fire is burning in your artery walls. If it's not, if you get those uh, tests, and we can help you order those. Uh, and they all come back negative because you're treating your arteries so nicely. Don't worry if your HDL is a little low. You know, it's it's no no one dies of low HDLs here. The the point is every meal that you pass through your arteries should give the message to those artery walls. Shh, calm down. You know, rice and beans and greens and fruits and vegetables give that message. Uh, the cooked meats and the oils and the sugars and the alcohol and the cigarettes, that, that gives the opposite message. That, that really damages the lining of the arteries. If you're not doing that, if you're really healing your arteries with every meal, if you're letting food be your medicine, um, the, the, the numbers are get less important. Uh, so uh, if there's any question, get those inflammatory markers. And again, we can give you guidance on that uh, if you want to make an uh, appointment to see Dr. Marvis or Dr. Miller. We'll be glad to help you with that. Or Dr. I Clapper. love that healing your arteries with every meal. That that was that's one that's a keeper. Um, and I was going to add one thing, one more thing to everything that he said, which is beautiful there. Um, and you you called it. Whoever wrote that question, you knew exactly. So exercise does raise your HDL for sure. So um, and it is important pandemic time. I mean, I feel like we can write a book on health things that have happened during the pandemic because we are eating. Maybe we're overeating. Maybe we're eating a little less clean than we normally do. Maybe we're a little more stressed out and we're not exercising as much because it's hard um, sometimes. And so get moving and I'm indoors, I'm in New Hampshire here and it's kind of cold and rainy and, and snowy and kind of yucky some days, but um, I'm trying to work out indoors and I'm committed to staying active no matter what. So um, that's something to think about too. Perfect. Um, and we had a question, will you be able to work with me in Oregon and what about insurance? Um, I am licensed in Oregon and we don't accept insurance, but we can do a couple of things for you. We can give you what we call a super bill, which is a receipt, which you can submit to your health insurance company, except for Medicare, which is against the law. That's another topic for another day. <laughs> and yes, that's okay. Anyway, 
no distractions. I will focus. Yes, and, and we are in Oregon. So yes, feel free to um, do that if you'd like. And all the pricing and information on the insurance is on plantbasedtelehealth.com. And thanks for considering us. That, that's really cool. Um, all right, we've got, let's move a little bit towards maybe blood pressure. Um, we've got some questions here. Let's see. Um, someone says, I'm taking amlodipine, valsartan, 10, 3, 20. Oh, look, this is 10 and 320 milligrams daily. Supposed to also take lisinopril 20 milligrams at night. Is this okay to take so much? Blood pressure is still high. So I think this outside of what medications you're on, one, your blood pressure is still high and why? Um, that would be a question. If you're eating a whole food plant-based diet, is something else going on? Is there something going on with your kidneys? Um, are you producing too much aldosterone? Is the flow, the blood flow to the kidney a problem? There's a thing called renal artery stenosis. So I think there's further investigation these occurred, but you really need to optimize your diet, but you need to control your blood pressure. And if that requires medications, you take the medications um, just because there's risk factors for heart failure, stroke, and all these different things. So, but um, yeah, blood pressure is a big one. So any thoughts or suggestions there guys on the blood pressure issue? Yeah, I agree. I would delve into that a little bit more and definitely stay on your medications because you don't want to have what be walking around with a dangerously high blood pressure. And I hope you're working with someone. Um, there's often things we can do to help with diet to really tweak and optimize it to make sure you've looked into other causes of high blood pressure and that that's being treated um, and anything else that you can be doing, any other factors that may be contributing to it. So that's a brief answer without knowing anything more about you. Um, remember, the arteries are tubes of muscle. They're long muscular tubes, and they can constrict and they can relax. And we want to do everything we do to get them nice and relaxed. Uh, and that is that because when they relax, they dilate, and then that lowers the blood pressure. So, what things make arteries relax? Well, one thing that makes them tighten up is salt in the diet. And uh, and I'm a recovering saltaholic. I love salty things, but <laughs> my blood pressure goes up. Uh, and so I've had to learn to entertain my tongue with non-salty flavorings with lemon juice and balsamic vinegars and things that uh, don't involve salt, but it's a real thing there. So to get the salt out for real, if you've got these kind of numbers, uh, it, you've got to do this for real. Uh, and things that relax blood vessels are minerals like magnesium and potassium. Hmm, what has magnesium and potassium? Dark green leafy vegetables uh, have magnesium and potassium. And so big helpings of those every day are really important. And um, here's where you, uh, you don't want to be putting coconut oil and any of these oils on your arteries, on your food, because it saturates into the walls of the arteries and keeps them from producing nitric oxide. Uh, here's where that whole food, whole food, plant-based diet comes in, underlying whole food. Uh, oils are not whole foods. And so, uh, so a, a diet with, with lots of greens. And like Dr. Esselstyn reminds us, if you, while you've got that big plate of broccoli or kale in front of you, a little balsamic vinegar adds the acetic acid that liberates the nitric oxide producing enzymes. So, uh, so have some, some greens with uh, some balsamic vinegar once or twice a day. I mean, yeah, if you really want to get off these meds and want to avoid a stroke, this is a serious business. Really uh, get Dr. Esselstyn's book on preventing and reversing heart disease and follow it to the letter. Uh, you, you're in that category. We'd love to see you get those pressures down without all those medications. But for right now, stay on the meds. Yeah, and I just like to add to that, you know, even if you're doing the diet correctly, there's other factors too to consider, like chronic pain or stress, lack of sleep. Um, definitely, you've seen patients with chronic migraines having elevated blood pressure, but then you're like, did the blood pressure cause the headache or the headache cause the, the, uh, the blood pressure? So again, that's really important to you, especially if you're having secondary symptoms, dizziness, vision problems, headaches chest discomfort, anything like that really needs to be taken care of immediately. So please take your medicines, follow up with your doctor. We'd be happy to help too, but it's really, 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 really important. So can't reiterate that enough. So um, we are out of time today. Dr. K has a, a next engagement of teaching, which is awesome to some amazing students. And we really appreciate your time. Um, any last final words from either Dr. Miller or Dr. Clapper? Just to say thank you guys. Those were fabulous questions. It's fun to be a part of this and hopefully this is helpful to you guys and you will keep staying healthy and spreading the word about how important it is to be healthy. Absolutely. Absolutely. These are so encouraging to hear people making the connection between their diet and their lifestyle and the disease that they're seeing and uh, and, uh, and asking for, for sincere, uh, simple ideas to help uh, help their bodies function better. We're glad to help that advice. So again, take advantage. We're, we're here to help. So uh, please uh, uh, arrange a consultation where uh, you'll find us 
a good team to have in your corner there. So thanks everybody. And I'm off to lecture the medical students at Nova Southeastern Osteopathic College of Medicine. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll see you next time. Bye Excellent. Bye. Well, they're blessed to have you, Dr. K. And so um, please guys, share the, share this video, share you know our plantbasedhealth.com website with your friends, family, any groups that you may be involved in. We really wanna spread the word. We're bringing on more doctors. We have, we're trying to build our capacity because we have so many patients, but we really, really would love to work with you. So plantbasedhealth.com. Again, it's Dr. Pierce, Dr. Miller, Dr. Clapper, and myself. So we're super stoked to see you guys. And we will see you in two weeks where we actually have Dr. Nicole Harkin, who is a um, plant-based cardiologist. So keep those questions in mind and I hope you can join us. So have a good one, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.